Hello and welcome to this event on the role of art and culture in the decolonization debate. I'm Shahid Abari, I'm Professor of Fashion and uh, Cultures in the Cultural yeah, and Historical yeah. Studies Department of London College of Fashion. And this event, as you will know, is part of the UAL yeah, Graduate yeah. Showcase, which is a brilliant opportunity to discover our students across UAL who will be the newest names in art, design, fashion, communication, media and performing arts. It's also an opportunity to reflect on our community, our practice and our priority themes at UAL. Equality, diversity and inclusion have been a significant part of that for a long time. But now, as the Black Lives Matter movement continues to make waves around the world, we find ourselves at a critical moment in the debate about race, culture, ethnicity and the arts. So what would meaningful anti-racist action look like? How do we as an institution reckon with colonial history? And what is the role of art and culture in driving social change? To discuss this, we're really fortunate in being joined by Hugh Locke. Hugh is a painter, sculptor and recipient of an honorary UAL doctorate. He was born in Edinburgh and lived in Guyana before studying art in the UK. And his work examines economies of power, often reworking historic monuments and documents, such as the Juras, a public sculpture, which was commissioned to commemorate the signing of the Magna Carta. His work has been exhibited internationally. David A. Bailey, MBE, is a photographer, writer, curator and lecturer. His practice is focused on black and diasporic representations in photography, performance, art and film. And he has been, amongst many other things, the co-director of the African and Asian Visual Arts Archive at the University of East London and acting director of the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. Over the years, he's been responsible for groundbreaking exhibitions, including Rhapsodies in Black, Art of the Harlem Renaissance at the Hayward in London and Back to Black at the Whitechapel Art Gallery. And Grace Dorito is an artist and was named in the Apollo 40 under 40 list. Her work has featured at the British Council, the Met and private collections worldwide. Grace's most recent project, The Year of Black Healing, is an artistic response to the co-option of black culture by politicians. And it includes a year long program of exhibitions, performances and talks. Grace's work thinks about decolonization, spiritual practice, black and indigenous culture, neoliberalism and racism. I can't think of three more better equipped speakers for our panel. Let me ask you all, first of all, that the recent months have felt like a monumental moment, a moment in fact in which monuments have toppled. Um, I think we've witnessed something remarkable following the death of George Floyd in police custody and the toppling of the Colston statue um, and, and also with the disproportionate BAME deficit during this pandemic. I want to know how you have felt about this uh, and, and whether you think we are witnessing something remarkable right now. David, perhaps you could go first. Hi, and is my thing still echoing? Is it we can still, hear okay. you, David. Yeah, brilliant. Great, and um, it's great to be here, and also with colleagues, um, uh, friends and colleagues, I have to say. Well, I think, first of all, it's quite interesting that it's, an, it's for me, it's like another, it's another moment. And just to kind of contextualize, we had a little quick discussion yesterday and, and it kind of lots of things came up in my mind. So I kind of had to kind of write a few things down because otherwise we could end up, I can end up waffling and give you all over the place. But um, really, I wanted to kind of say that what's quite important for this moment is I think for the first time, people are beginning to join up the dots and I can speak a bit more about what that means um, in terms of historically and in terms of generationally. Um, and also at the same time, multiple voices are being heard at the same time. And I feel that we're in a moment which is true, truly very, very global than what's been happening before. One of the things I wanted to kind of quickly raise was kind of to contextualize uh, my kind of view and interest in relationship to my own history, if I may kind of talk about that for a few minutes, which kind of would have, I would assume would overlap with Grace as well as Hugh. Well, I think, um, and I want to be very specific about that because I think one of the things I think is gets quite murky in this discussion, <clears throat> pardon me, is that we get kind of, uh, we talk about generalizations and I think lots of people want to kind of feel, feel they, the need now to be more sort of specific around certain issues and how specific issues relate to kind of a very specific context and very specific kind of relationship to um, people's experiences and, and, and life. So um, for me, 
one of the things I felt was quite interesting is that uh, I just want to talk about three moments how in my experience um, this has come up um, and, and in different areas. I think, you know, for us, and I'm really talking about people born um, um, late 50s, um, early 1960s, I would definitely say we've, we've been through three different, I would say at least three different kind of moments of this. I think the first is the 50s and 60s. Um, we were growing up and very young, and you have to remember at that time, um, some of us um, who are from the Caribbean um, uh, were experiencing at this moment at a time where, um, you know, so most of our countries and and, and, and you, Guyana and Barbados in particular, Barbados is where I'm from, uh, my parents are from, um, didn't have any independence until 1966. So for, for us, it was growing up in a moment where actually decolonization actually meant the idea of, of decolonizing and becoming a, a separate entity from the colony, which is Britain, and, and becoming independent. So there's that to think about in terms of my generation. Secondly, in the 60s and 70s, um, there's the question about, you know, what other movements were taking place while we were growing up? And I've only just listed a few. One is that one would forget, but, you know, we were growing up in the movement of apartheid, which was happening in South Africa at that time. Um, there was the Cold War, which also led to the Berlin Wall, um, which involved places like Cuba, parts up now, Africa, particularly Ethiopia, Guyana. And also um, there was the American Civil Rights Movement. And also there was kind of Northern Ireland. Um, civil rights movement, so which is which is a pretty hardcore decolonization armed um, struggle. Now, the reason I say Northern Ireland because much later on, when you look at the work of Steve McQueen, one of his first films is Hunger, um, which had to do um, with the hunger strikes that were going on in terms of um, Ireland and the kind of independence movement. And I think Steve chose that in a way to kind of think about what he was looking at when growing up and identifying with in terms of decolonization independence movement. And lastly, just to say that, you know, growing up in the 80s with Thatcher um, really was quite an, I, another kind of British state kind of moment where lots of people were thinking about ways in which to kind of deconstruct that through um, people who were did go to university and art school, uh, were forming collectives um, and also kind of taking up editorial and curatorial control. So, which is why the question, when you look at artists and kind of, from my generation, uh, people being formed, alliances through education and university, which I know we're going to talk about a bit later. Uh, and if you look at the Black Art Group, if you talk about Marlene, Marlene Swiss experience, um, she would talk about the art school being a very important area of not only contestation, but also alliances as well. Um, so really just to say, these were things that were happening very separately in terms of different moments which came together. But I feel that the moment we're experiencing now is one where all these things are coming together. Yeah, thank you, David. What about you, Hugh? How, how have the events of recent weeks felt to you and does it feel like a, a, a remarkable moment? Oh, I, I can't hear you, Hugh. I think you're muted. Ah. Uh, the, the etiquette, the, the etiquette of the media. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. So um, I was kind of shocked actually, because shocked in a positive way. Basically, for me, it was like you drifting along in this fog of COVID nineteen and all the regulations and the the, the the bloody drag nightmare of the whole thing. And then this just happened, you know, George Floyd, that the horror of that. But I. Didn't I, I didn't envisage a reaction like this? I mean, a lot of people being killed by the police. We've seen seen a lot of a lot of this coming over from the U.S. We've seen you know about death in custody here and stuff like that. But, but this, I think, coinciding with COVID nineteen was a particular moment. And for me to see young black people marching down Whitehall protesting, man. <laughs> that was wonderful. That was just people, we ain't taking this crap no more, you know. That was just, and it was it was the intensity of it, you know. I mean, and uh, we've had these things before. I mean, years ago, back in the eighties, there was a new crossfire. Thirteen young people died, and twenty thousand people people marched. 
you know, with, 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 this, with the slogan, 13 dead, nothing said, you know, and this was, uh, it, it had an echo of that, you know, the echo of that past thing. But I would like to think that this is not just a moment, because basically, quite frankly, I think there's a whole bunch of people who want, you know, uh, if we keep quiet, let, 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 give them enough rope and A, give, a, give them enough rope and they'll hang themselves, i.e. the movement will hang themselves, or B, let, 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 if we just let them, let it ride, man, and they, it'll it'll just disappear and die down. Because basically the, the, there's a whole bunch of people who want this to disappear and it needs to not disappear. <laughs> you know, mm. that's, that's a fact. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's something we have to talk about, I think, as well, between ourselves. I, I think we've lost Grace momentarily, and I'm hoping she'll come back, but um, I'll, I'll ask her that question when she returns. But can I ask the two of you about your own practice? Because our, our, our discussion is specifically about decolonization in the arts, and it would be great to find out about your practice and how and whether questions of decolonization bear upon your work. I wonder, Hugh, if you want to go first on that. Um, yeah, let me hit my presentation. So, whoops, uh, I'll go start. Ah, uh, boy, the system is a tricky one. We can see it, brilliant. Yeah, okay, fine. Okay, so um, what's interesting to me is it, I, I've been working with the whole idea of what, the, who is the hero? Who are these, who are statues? being put up to in this country and generally speaking in, around the world you know europe asia not not asia but i mean europe and the us um and uh and it, it, it because what, what what i felt was people would walk past statues every day and they were so visible that they were invisible people would not people just take them for granted except for this guy I was a friend was reminding me that uh, this is obviously Colston, right? And what what I should say is that this this piece is uh, is a photograph mounted in aluminium to which I have affixed objects. And what this is about this is about impossible proposals. This is stuff which I wouldn't be allowed to do. What it started that the whole series started as I as ideas interrogating what statues are about. Um, but to be truly honest, one of the reasons why the work came about was because I had this idea, these ideas anyway, but the idea of statue dressing is, 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 was what it was about. And um, I approached an organization um, to, to, uh, to, to, to get this thing off the ground. I just won a big award. I won a Hamlin award. So I thought, I'm, I'm in, man. You know, so I approached everybody, you know, and I, I thought I've arrived, you know, not a wake up call. I ain't arrived yet. You know? Anyway, uh, that's another story. But, so, so, but then I, I, I was turned down by this organization. And what I did was like, like most artists, you try to take rejection and turn it into something else. So the rejection turned into a whole, a whole body of work, you know, and and uh, so, so I've been working on it before. I presented this stuff to these guys, and um, and but then the idea kicked off further as a sort of rest. I, I, I'm going to make this into a thing anyway. So Colston, this this piece here is 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 Colston. Um, it's um, as you can see, it's mounted on aluminium stuff. Fixed it cowrie shells for the slave trade. It was shown in Bristol Bristol 13 years ago as uh, in in an old church at that time they were, he's he was still a highly contested figure there and debates about getting rid of him and stuff like that so for me to see him go was quite a shock um i move on and this is the other guy i got really obsessed with for all his iconic reasons so this is uh, this is churchill so these are basically um uh, acrylic on on c type and what I would say to people is that this is how London will look like when I'm king. You know, the, 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 this is, this is <laughs> going to be. And what it's about is controlling your environment. Because it's almost like, it's not necessarily for me at times some overt racism I may, see, may have received. It's about, it's about a, a, a kind of, uh, it's like fighting fog, you know, sometimes. People have their ways of control, right? Which which are more comp which, which are more subtle, shall we say? You know what I mean? Than than than, than something overt and uh, Enoch Powell style. You know. Uh, I go on to another one. 
So I've been debating about who is this guy? What 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 is he to the nation? So and this one here, um, the writing at the bottom says, um, and um, it's about oh, the finest hour. If the, if the British Empire stands for a thousand years, they will say it's his finest hour. You know, so that's what's written at the at, at the bottom there, and uh, it's basically playing with these statues, you know, and knowing. Uh, but and here's the complex thing as well, because knowing that Churchill is um, important figure. But at the same time, he was a racist and an imperialist, right? And and I up until a year and a half ago, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit I was I used to say, well, I have these conflicting things with him, but also I wouldn't exist without him because of his part in the Second World War. Now I'm ha now I'm now I'm quite seriously revising that opinion and thinking, you know, I'm not so sure about this dude at all. Yeah. But we have any other prime minister who that's his model. Um, in, right now, that's a different story. To see racists written on them, uh, stuck on them during the Black Lives Matter protests, like, all oh, right, these guys, these young guys, they're not fooled by this guy at all, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. this one here, this final image, this is Washington. Um, now, when you look into what these statues are about, it's really, really interesting. This statue was given by the Commonwealth of, this is outside the National Gallery. And these guys hide in plain sight, I feel, you know what I mean? They, 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 they're, you know, trying to be anonymous. And um, what I've done, Washington, obviously well-known slave owners, uh, and, but not a, and, and, and not a good slave master at all, it, as if there was that, it, that, 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 that's not to say they were good slave masters, but he was, he was not nice, you know? And, uh, and, and what I, I found out, names of his slaves, and they're written in, they're written in behind him, dotted around there, some of the names of some of the slaves, the people who tried to escape and stuff like that. But what, the, the, what's interesting about this statue is that when it, was, it, when it was put up, it stands on American soil, literally American soil, given by the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1924. This statue was a bit like Vic, Queen Victoria's statues, which were replicated and sent around the world. And this statue was, of Washington was copied many times. The original is in Virginia and sent around the world, sent, sent around the world. So yeah. it's sent in 1924 and that's full Jim Crow era time. So, and that's a similar kind of thing to the Colston. Colston was put up at the height of empire. So there's, I, I, for me, there's a parallel between this and the Confederate statues. I want to draw Grace in in a moment, but can I ask you, Hugh, just very quickly about the Colston, that the series restoration from your slide, I could see it was dated 2006. So it takes another 14 years for that statue to come down. And I wonder whether now reflecting back, whether you feel like, you know, that we're lots of people are only just catching up with the conversation you were already attuned to in 2006 and before that, or whether you felt like your your work was was building up towards that. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, personally, I wouldn't be so arrogant as to say that people are catching up with me, but privately, that's what I would think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I, I'll explain the reason why. Because it was. Th th this subject matter was deeply unfashionable. It was interesting when I w when I presented the work to some people, but 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 it was not a fashionable subject matter at all by any stretch of the imagination, you know. And and even that was like so unfashionable, you know, um, not a cool thing to be. Hugh, you're slightly freezing up. I think you've frozen now. So uh, has everybody frozen? Oh, there you are, Hugh. You, you're slightly frozen there, but you're fine. Okay. But okay, I, no I, would, I would just say that now everybody thinks that you're the coolest artist. Oh, no, 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 no. Trust me, they, they, they really do not. <laughs> But, but let me let me let me draw Grace in because we lost Grace momentarily, and I should remind everybody who's listening that you can write questions in the chat box, and we'll we'll, we'll come to the questions and I'll pose them to our panel. But Grace, I started by asking everyone how they felt about the events of recent week, and maybe I can ask you that before getting you to talk about your work. Yes, well, I, I guess I felt. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I felt really like very motivated and very honoured to be alive in such a time. Actually, to see such passion, like from all the young people, like kicking down doors and stuff. And I think it's interesting for me when I look back then to that lives matter, like uh, three years ago, like how it's really taken the pandemic to really 
for people to take um, BLM seriously. You know, because it, it, it's the combination, isn't it, of ha people, of the world having to stop, people having to reflect, inside, bored by lockdown or frustrated or whatever, and then for the mainstream to take Black Lives Matter seriously, it's really because of the pandemic. You know, if the pandemic hadn't happened and that video of George Floyd had been disseminated, the same people would get upset that always get upset and you know would be on it but now this time it was like the mainstream were like oh yeah there is an issue oh yeah there is like to find it like they'd have time to you know to reflect to take it seriously so i think those two combinations and then i guess in my own practice i've been working around a lot of issues um not necessarily Black Lives Matter, but working with a lot to do with decolonization, refugees, migrants, um, and from a different, maybe a very different perspective uh, than Hugh and David, actually, in terms of like what we've been talking about. Um, in my own practice, I've been, uh, I'll put some images on. Um, you want to do that now? Yeah, I'll, I'll put some images on. So this is a project I've been doing called Healing the Museum. And so uh, my own background, I should say, um, I grew up in a very activist household. You know, my mother, she, um, in the 80s, we went to a lot of um, pro-multicultural marches. She had a group with her friends called Women in the Third World. So this kind of, you can imagine as a child having this kind of activist um, upbringing. But also we had a very pluralistic uh, upbringing in terms towards spirituality and religion so um i was brought up in a household where even though my parents are both from kenya and i also spent time there as a small child i also grew up in birmingham um in a working class neighborhood and we would have like i would go to catholic school but i'm not catholic and then we'd have buddhist books at home and hindu books at home so very open so from a young age, I've been kind of trying to, I've had like a, maybe a double life. And you can see that on my website because I have my art CV and I have my spiritual CV. And they start at basically the same time of like 18, 19 years old. And you can see the trajectory of both things happening. And the reason why I talk about healing is because healing is obviously a very difficult process. And so, my ideas of healing the museum is like how to bring different energies into these spaces um, that are difficult, but also different audiences. So I've been doing these um, long term project by doing different shamanic performances and meditation performances in like places like the Pompidou in 2013. And I wrote an essay in 2016. And so the most recent thing that I thought could be interesting to share is some images from a performance I did in the African Museum in Belgium, which is a very problematic museum because it was um, founded by Leopold, the king, uh, when it was about, well, Belgium um, had a colony in the Congo. So everything in the, in the museum is from Congo. So you can think of it in relation to the British Museum. And so over the time, you know, different debates have come up and then the museum was closed for 10 years. And there was this idea that the museum would be decolonized in, that, in those 10 years. But then when it reopened, it was really um, obvious that not much had changed. So maybe some of the architecture had changed, but really the, like actually um, the problems with the objects and how to recontextualize them hadn't really been done, even in that long period. So I've been invited by the Goethe Institute to do a long term project um, where we go to different museums in Europe. So we went to a museum in Barcelona. These are ethnographic and um, museums. So like the, like the British, British Museum. So um, in, yeah, in Barcelona, in Lisbon, in, in France. And basically, we were a group of academics, scientists, artists, activists, and museum directors. We have these like closed workshops. And so this was the first one in the African Museum. And so we did this kind of, I did this kind of performance where I got everybody, including the museum director and some of his staff to join us and to sit down and like, so what we do is we kind of do a meditation and we connect with the objects in the room. 
um, because I'm really interested in the idea that through our logical, rational way of thinking, we have ended up at this point in history. You know, we always end up with the same answers. It's either Republican or Democrat, you know, Labour, Conservative. It's always very narrow, whereas there are other answers that can be got, but you need other methodologies. So like meditation or shamanism. So my idea is like when we were like, met, so we're in the mineral and crystal room. So, and this is everybody who's actually um, um, sitting on the floor. You can see, this is mm. the director actually on the bottom right hand side. How, how did he take to it? Can I ask how did the, your, your participants respond to this exercise? Because it, it must have been, you know, a, a complete up ending of museum etiquette, I imagine. Yes, I mean, for him, it was really interesting because my whole project of cleaning the museum is to have like different, to kind of get rid of the power dynamics and to have people lying on the floor in museums or sitting on the floor. And it doesn't really matter what the job of the person is next to you. Um, it really nullifies it. And what was interesting, he has never sat on his own museum floor in 20 years. I found that really surprising and so did some other people, you know. And so you can see there is a disconnection between him as his role and actually him as a human, you know. And so this, I, this kind of exercise is to kind of to bring the human <laughs> back into the museum. So what we did is we meditated and then we talked about the essay Healing the Museum. And what came up was really interesting because um, some of the artists and scientists were from the Congo. Oh, wow. And so they were really moved because all the objects in there are like minerals that were stolen from the Congo and put in the museum. So they were like crying and really upset because obviously when you meditate, you're opening up. And so then what it meant that when we started to then have the sessions about logistics of objects, restitution, reparation, you know, like more practical things, because we'd gone like through this experience together, it was like a really weird cathartic and joining of people together, these, these 20 people. And so it became really a powerful experience. And people still like, you know, comment today about it or write about it and stuff because it, in, in, in the project, we had like the directors of the Humboldt Forum, which is a very controversial new museum that's going to be in Berlin. Uh, it used to be a Prussian palace and now it has the house of, it has like the German collection and also Asian and Africa all mixed together. So you can imagine this kind of project, how controversial it is. Mm. And so they were in uh, the workshop and also the anti Humboldt people were there. So you've got this workshop where people just are like, because <laughs> it's closed, people are allowed to just like shout at each other and debate, you know, um, this, this, these topics and that's needed. But what did the meditation does? It, it kind of makes it much more grounded and mm -hmm. lets you find other answers that isn't just about connecting to your intellect. And so for me, you know, for many years, I've been, that's why I have it on my CV as well, like, so that people understand this to me is not a fashion thing. Oh, well, meditation. And Grace, I, I totally know how we need to end our session now as well. I might have to hand over to you <laughs> to do that. But let me let me draw in David. Um, I'm I'm totally gripped by this project and I, I want to know more about it. But but yeah. David, while I, I have you there as well, can I ask can you I, can about? I, can I interrupt? Yeah, for a yeah, of course. Go for it, David. Hello. Can, can we hear you, David? Are you are you off? Oh yeah. Um... But I think you wanted to say something. Did you want to say something? I think, I think he's got. I think you. He, he's just. Oh, there's you. He's. I think he's slightly frozen. So, David, I was going to ask you um, about your own curatorial practice and how decolonization bears upon that. But I think you wanted to respond to Grace as well, didn't you? Um, yeah, I'm just very, very conscious that um, we've got. We haven't got little. We haven't got little time, and I just want to see. Um, be great if we had um, some crossover conversations as well, because um, it's we, such a rarity that we all of us are in the same kind of space together. Yeah. Um, just Grace and Hugh, really. I just wanted to say that I feel that like the commonality between what we do. I think the process and the tools that we use are different, but there are, there is several commonalities. I think 
we all we all of us are very much concerned about spatialness and space um and also we're very concerned about the idea of ideology and ideas which is why i feel both your work Hugh, and your work grace is very kind of i'd say conceptual but very ideologically based um and it's great grace to hear you talk about the question of healing which has now become such a prominent thing now in terms of the healing justice movement which i think it's very important for us to kind of recognize that as an expansive ideological tool now to rethink these things at the, at the same time I, i'm really quite interested also but i think this is a separate date but I just wanted to kind of make a note of both um i feel commonalities between some of your past work race and some of hugh's work and i think i would definitely think that in relation to adornment your works have a very interesting commonality and which I think is very now in terms of how people look, how people dress, how people kind of uh, create their own identity through adornment. It's very much present, I feel, Hugh, in your work and I think the, the sculptural work that you do is very much part of the question of adornment. And Grace, I was very, I mean, one of the works that really I liked and, and I'm, I'm very, I still get very excited about is how you took on corporations and globalization with Nike, which is, of course, Nike is about a globalized kind of colonizing of adornment and how you took that on in the same way that Hughes taken on, and they're hiding in plain sight, as Hughes' point is about how statues are hiding in plain sight, both, both at the same time, and how both in those two things, things that ha have historically taken place around these questions of space and adornment, and I'm really talking about areas of carnival, have a very much a historical root in terms of art making and image making, which of course is much more populist, but also a very much was started as a kind of decon, I would say carnival was probably the first decolonization movement around the planet, to be honest. Um, but really just to talk about how, you know, what, how we use space differently and how we also use the question of ideas and ideologies within those spaces, um, which is definitely the case in terms of my curatorial work and my past artworks. And how I found when you both were talking, Hugh and Grace, that I feel that there's, there's a, there was a question of space and commonality. And I think mm. the Black Lives Movement is really looking at the question of how to occupy space and how to reoccupy some of those ideas. Grace, did you want to have a go at that question? I think we've been wanting to ask you again. Or did you want to respond to it? What was the exact question? Like, it, it was about space, wasn't it? About how space is uh, featuring or is, sh is, is such a critical part of this decolonization project about occupying space, changing space, and how it features in all of your work. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for me, I guess, in terms of space, in terms of like that's what I was saying about bringing different audiences, different energies in, but also about in terms of the collection, you know, I wrote a, another essay called Ways of Seeing a New Museum Story for Planet Earth. And this is really about how we value objects. We always value objects monetarily, then culturally, and lastly, spiritually, you know, ethnographic objects. But actually, those objects were made for specific rituals, you know. And if you, if the object, let's say, um, like a totem pole, is stuck inside, in you know, in glass, it's not fulfilling its actual function, which means that actually we are damaging our own emotional and our own uh, mental and spiritual health by not connecting with objects on a um, on a different level. You know, and I think in terms of space, yeah, space can be literal space, like four walls, but it can be also mean on these other, let's say, more um, non-rational, shamanic uh, ways. Hugh, did you want to have a go at that? Um, well, I, I'm struggling here with, it, with, it, with this connection. I don't know oh, what's sorry. happened. All of a sudden, uh, all wow. of a sudden, the whole thing has gone weird on me. While we've got um, so, you, David was asking about space and whether that features in your work. When you say space, what do you mean space? What do you Can mean I, by space? In, in terms of Hugh, I was talking about how um, your work, your work. I mean, obviously, all works occupy space, whether it's the white cube or whether it's the public realm. So I was trying to make a relationship between how we both like the idea of kind of making strategic interventions within a public realm space as well as a white cube space where it's a museum and gallery at the same time what i'm interested in is how both you and grace 
also work with the question of ideas, conceptual ideas, but also ideas around culture, but also ideas around adornment, which is definitely, I feel, it, within yeah, your work, yeah. embrace as well, as well. So I was, I was trying to wrap all those things as a thing which we all are preoccupied with, but also how we deal with strategically differently with. I mean, for, for you, okay, we're in, a, we're in an economic crisis now. The reason why I make public art is because of the last economic crisis, the financial crash. I have a public art piece in Bristol, which is grave markers for dead or seriously ill um, financial companies. And, um, and the thing is, I didn't want to make, I, I explained it because I didn't want to make work which existed in the environment i want to be in a white cube secure because when i go outside i have to deal with the uk i have to deal with this country and 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 and, and on on a on a different kind of terminology and it took me basically some i, I was broke and it's like right fine i'm taking whatever job's going and that's how i became an artist who works in the public sphere that's how things like the jurors come around but working outdoors uh, and working in the public space, I know you're not just talking about that, David. Working in the public space comes with a whole bunch of different issues. You know, your your audience is not your audience is the passerby. They they haven't walked through the door and or or they haven't paid some admission or or or, or summoned up the whatever to walk through the door of the gallery to see your work. It's a very different thing, mm -hmm. and and working politically in the public space. That's a whole other question as well, because you're trying not to give people easy fodder, you know what I mean? Like that's I'm not anyway, you know? Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's tricky, it's tricky. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you a, a question related to, to, to David's point about space before we turn to questions. Um, and I, this is a question about the, the spaces that we circulate in. I think many of us are having to ask hard questions of ourselves and our communities and our institutions. Certainly here at UAL, our students have challenged us about how meaningful our commitment to Black Lives Matter is and, and anti-racism is. And it, it's very difficult to hear and important to listen to that. But it also strikes me that it's very difficult to say, it's difficult to articulate those criticisms. And I wondered about you, have, have you felt that you've had to call out the institutions that you belong to, the organizations that you rely on, the professional communities you belong to. Have, have you felt that way? Has that been hard? For, for, for me personally? Yeah, um, or for all of you, but you, you could yeah, go first. No, I mean, yes, in, in some ways, yes, over time, you know. But um, what, what I've, I, I've, I've, you know what? To be honest, at times I've let things slide, you know? And I'm talking about subtle, I'm not talking about overt things, I'm talking about subtle little things. And um, because you think, you know what, I, have I got the energy for this bloody battle? You know, because it's a battle we're talking about, you know. And what, what, there's, a, there's a website, I can't remember the name of the website, but it's a very good website. And you go online, put, put in what I'm talking about, you'll understand it. It's a website of curators, right? Curators, um, curators of color around the world posting anonymously what's been said to them by white curators and white directors and stuff like that. And it's shocking, <laughs> it's shocking, you know? And, um, and, and the, thing, but the thing is they haven't put their people in the play, in their place because it's, it's a hierarchy, you know what I mean? You know, like they, 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 you, 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 I have a job to preserve, you know? Now things are different. The things, something shifted recently. You know, I, I feel, I don't know how you other guys feel, but I think, so, I would like to think that something has shifted, mm. you know? Grace or David, do you want to come in? Yeah, I'm, I mean, you're, you're sorry. <laughs> you're asking about my specific relation. Um, yet, I mean, obviously I've experienced racism in the art world, but more from, as an artist, by, by not being selected for things, being told your work's not British enough, you're not, exactly. you know, stuff like that, or, you know, then if I'm not British enough, I also get reverse some weird other race, and you're not African enough when I've done African show, like, it's like, you know, and then, um, yeah, in terms of like, I would say more like in the gallery, in the market world, in terms of like, you can see how, um, 
you know, in terms of white privilege, in terms of like the power structure, how you're really at the bottom of the power structure, even though if we didn't actually make any work, there would be no art market in our world. So it's like a perversion, really. Um, and yes, you know, I have spoken out like sometimes I've, you know, um, you know, I wrote a whole essay called Institutional Racism and Spiritual Practice. I mean, you can read it on my website. You know, I've been writing about racism, I don't know, the last four or five years, lots of different essays. Um, because I really want, you know, you know, I, I, I meet a lot of BA and MA students and postgraduate students, and I really want them to be motivated to, you know, to carry on. You know, and, to, and I can feel that they are, they're really, you know, like getting there and stuff. And I'm going to be really, you know, the role of art schools, you know, I think is a key thing, like of like understanding and supporting, um, yeah, this debate, you know, and also in, how can I explain, I did a show in Glasgow five years ago. And uh, the students really took to it a lot, you know. I didn't get um, any um, mainstream art reviews, but it was quite a big show, you know. I got like, I had like four different you know, rooms and stuff. But I think it was the first time that a lot of students understood that their work could function in different ways, that it wasn't just about putting objects in the space and it wasn't just about doing a performance, it was this kind of like more um, mm. activation, you know, of mm. these topics um, in, you know, in a mental and a verbal and a more spiritual way, you know. Mm. Uh, so I'm, I'm going in a very long circle. But yeah, yeah. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like actually the key point is, yeah, you should be trying to say things or, <laughs> You know, I mean, yeah. but the thing I think the whole debate is, is the fact that racism isn't actually our issue in the sense of like, we're not the ones being racist, but we have the burden of changing yeah. racism. Yeah. And I think that's also an important thing um, for white friends and colleagues to understand yeah. that they're actually the ones that have to do the work. You know, we can support them, we can help them, we can, you know, um, but actually it's not our burden. But unfortunately, but fortunate and unfortunately, we share the same world, don't we? You yeah. Know? So that's why we can't just like you can't just like cut off and say, oh, I'm not going to do anything as a black artist either, because it's a negotiation of space. <laughs> because we share resources, we share things. Should we draw you in, David, before we turn to, to questions? Did, did you have a response to that as well, David? Yeah, I think. Grace, you, I mean, that's, you've said a lot, so I'm not quite sure how to add to that, only just to say, very, just very quickly, that I think to be in a, a diverse artist in the late 20th and, and, the, 20, and the 21st century um, requires that the process of calling out is, we do that every day through our work, through participating in events such as these, through, as Grace points out, in our writing. So, um, so the process of calling out is in the process of the making and in the process of the research and, and mm. in the process of our work as well, which is why I, I, I talked sorry, too long about the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s to make a point that, you know, the, the specific question of decolonization for, I feel for me and my peers has been that the weapons that we use in terms of decolonization is through our artistic practice, really, which a few and Grace have just eloquently just spoke about mm. at length. And so, yeah. Great. Thank you. We, let's turn to the questions. Well, there, there, there is one already which I will, will ask uh, on behalf of the question asker and I'll encourage everybody else who's watching, listening to entering questions and just type it into the comment box and it will, uh, it may come to me I hope. Um, so this is from Melina. Do you think the goal of isolating our heritage or art in glass cases like the totem pole example is how the patriarchy works to keep our voices silent. So this is about exhibiting and isolating heritage in glass cases is a way for particularly the patriarchy to keeping uh, a way for them to keep our voices silent. Does anybody want to have a go at that question? 
Grace, I feel like it might be one for you. Yeah, unfortunately, that was for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, I thought that was an interesting analogy um, in terms of like saying, yeah, I mean, I guess because I've been working a lot with different indigenous groups, I should say also in Vancouver and in Argentina. So, and what I noticed from working with First Nation groups or Mapuche, um, is the same issues come up, the same issues that we see in the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, of this stolen land, as, as BP or not to BP says, stolen land, stolen climate, stolen culture. The, the three things are connected. So anything to do with patriarchy is also connected to do with capitalism, which is connected to do with land rights, to do with environmental, and that's why things like Extinction Rebellion um, can't stay in white movements, you know, like if it's really going to be a successful movement, um, it has to reach out, you know, and open up. And I think that's interesting. That's why I always come back to the pandemic and the um, coming together with the Black Lives Matter, that the two things that we see, the pandemic is caused by human um, <laughs> human interference with nature, let's say, <laughs> because of globalisation and the way that we live, you know, um, in terms of the way our connected to with the environment. And this is, uh, this is also connected to, to do with how we have um, collected objects, you know, and taken them from Indigenous people and how those communities haven't had access to those objects. And so, and you know, it's, it, 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 it's all one big system, isn't it? You yeah. Know? So, yeah, I mean, she's right in a way that those, it is, um, a, yeah, you could use it as a metaphor. Yeah. You know? But I meant literally that totem poles, they need to be outside in the sun in the week because that's what they were made for. So yeah. they're not fulfilling their function. But yeah, yeah you could say, sorry, sorry, you could say that we as artists are not necessarily able to fulfill. Well, sorry, we're getting a little bit of interference. It, it, carry on, Hugh. Uh, great, Grace. So sorry, I was, I was just saying, um, we as artists are not necessarily able to fill our, fulfill our function because especially as black artists, because we have all these, you know, limitations, you know, in terms of like um, what, what kind of work we can make, where we can show it. I mean, do we fit into this box, this box, this box? Yeah. You know, and everyone blames the market, but we are the market because human beings created the market. So, yeah. you know. Hugh, I, w I wonder if you could have a go at that question too, because it might speak to your work. It was about whether the kind of traditional modes of exhibiting work in glass boxes is a way of silencing questions about work. And your work seems to me much more public focused um, and, and, and your, your work in, in terms of its practice is kind of contesting that glass box strategy of, of archiving art in, in aspic. What, what do you think, Hugh? I mean, I, I, I think every artist has their own way of working. And, um, you know, um, there are artists who will, 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 will paint and painting, you can't necessarily be... Well, Hugh, your, your, your screen has frozen again. Hanging a paint. Oh, okay, I don't... I... No, you're there now. <laughs> you're back. I don't know what's going on with it. Right, yeah. So, um, I, I, I... Sorry, okay. So... <laughs> Oh, we're slightly struggling with your connection, Hugh, I think. I'm so sorry um, for you, Hugh, and for our people watching. Um, perhaps we can come back to you, Hugh. I, to recap. I'm, ah. Okay, because can I say something? Yeah. What, what you need to do, cause somebody needs to get hold of me and shut this um, slide thing down, because I couldn't see any of, the sli any, any of Grace's presentation. I'll see if our, our technical team can shut the slides down to... To do that. Did, you want to, that did you want to try and answer Hugh very quickly while, while we have the connection? Yeah, sorry, the, the question would be, yeah, so, so I mean, the, the whole practice is open to many different things. I understand the question, but the thing is, if you show those form of, 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 of self expression Oh, Hugh, I'm so sorry. We're, we're having real trouble with your line. I am so sorry because I'm desperate to hear what you have to say. But perhaps um, we, we, we might pause our question to you and I can turn Pressure. to you. Just re yeah, uh, I'm so sorry, Hugh. Just, just reconnect completely. 
Oh, we're struggling slightly with you, Hugh. Yeah. I think I might ask our technical team to deal with that while I, I turn to you, David, because there was another question that I thought that perhaps you might address, um, which oh, was can I, um, can I, from can I quickly Nick. just Can I just quickly course, address David. the previous question? Cause of I think, course, David, yeah. Um, so I think, Grace, like the question about the totem pole, I think is an interesting one, and the whole question about that within an object in a glass box is interesting and again I, I want to return to the work about what you did around Nike and I think the whole idea is that you know quite easily I can see organizations such as Benetton and Nike putting a totem pole on on their shoes or their clothing garments do you see what I mean and in some ways I think if you look at shops like Nike or Benetton they are they are virtually kind of museums and galleries um, in that sense, in terms of how things are categorised, how things are put into glass cases and boxes, etc. Which is why I, I always kind of refer back, Grace, to your point about your work on Nike. It's quite important or, or on that type of kind of commodification um, because I feel like that work was one of, one of the key works at that period to address the crossover between um, commodified culture in museums and and, and 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 galleries in relation to consumerism and the commodified cult culture and appropriation of that culture in consumerisms at the same time. So I just needed to quickly yeah. say that and he cool. also addressed so, that as well. David, let me ask you this question from our from our, 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 our listeners or and viewers. This is Lucy. She, she said she's noted that some of us have said that it feels different now because of BLM. While it's essential to have hope, future visions and commitments to action and learning to enable institutional change, what do you think are the main barriers to embedding anti racist anti racist practices in the visual arts? So what are the main barriers to embedding anti racist practices in the visual arts. Do you want to have a go at that David and we'll see if we can get Hugh back as well? Yeah I think it's 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 several things I would say just three 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 very quick things one is about listening um, you know and listening requires a, a level of participation that requires to be not just responsive but to take a form of leadership so my question will be the second point would be leadership in relationship to that and the third is about remembering in as well which is a lot of things that we have talked about is the idea that somehow those who have come before us um and what's been difficult is trying to bring the three things together um so for instance i think what we're trying to do today for instance is do things a we're trying to listen to each other um uh, with technical difficulties but at the same time we're also trying to remember things um, in two different ways. Remember things that happened in the past, and and Grace has, has beautifully and eloquently talked about remembering things historically and spiritually, which is also a form of remembrance at the same time. And how we bring those things into the conversation. Um, and it's about if we can get those three things together in a kind of organic mix. I think that would help hinder some of the problems we would have. Yeah. Shall, shall I answer? Okay, okay, so yeah, thank you, David, because you keep bringing up my past work and things. <laughs> yeah, and actually in 2000, if students want to go back and look up my earlier videos, I have earlier videos like Absolute Native, which is actually using the typography and imagery of Absolute Vodka, but to talk about um, um, the world debt and the World Bank, you know, and it's really interesting because when you watch that video, you know, I use a quote by Joseph Stiglitz, who's like um, one of the main economists of that period. Nothing has really changed. So if, if, if you want to see some um, earlier videos, I think it could be interesting for students to go back and watch. And then about this anti-racist thing, I really think it's it's three things. It's, it's like it's what David said, but also the willingness to do it. OK the ability to do it and having humility and when I talk about the ability I mean in terms of like for me what's clear it's not just about um I'm gonna say decision making and rational processes racism is also it's to do with remapping the mind and actually how the mind works. So it, it goes into the category of the way that our neurons process information, um, the way that we um, have phobias, you know, and how we work on things like that. So things like hypnosis, NLP, meditation, these are things that I 
there's some, if you look at an essay I wrote called Call to White America, when Trump was first elected, and um, these are essays where I try to give examples of ways that we have to, anti-racism is actually also to do with our mental relationship to other people. So it's not just externalizing, you know, because we can forever do workshops in museums or institutions and where people go along and they say, OK, I'm here to, um, you know, they go along, in, let's say, in good intentions. But actually, racism is a much more core, under, core understanding of the way that we relate to the world. Yeah. And that actually takes deep contemplation and deep mental rethinking of how you negotiate with other people who aren't like you yeah and that's the work that's hard to uh have been institutionalized and stuff that that's the work that people have to do individually and yeah. conversations with their families and you know what i mean that that's actually the work that's the only way the world can become anti-racist Thank you for that, Grace. Let me see if I can draw Hugh back in. If he's, if he's, he's frozen like a, a, a statue. In fact, um, <laughs> oh, Hugh, I'm so sorry. I feel terrible about this because we would really like to hear from you. Let me ask this question to you, David, and we'll see if we can draw Hugh back. This is a question from L. Scott. Where do you think the compromise lies between the roles museums have as an educational tool and the colonial implications that they bring? So the compromise between the role museums have as an educational tool and the colonial implications that they bring. Is there a compromise to be had here, David? Yeah, there's always, there's always a compromise um, with anything we do, and um, and there would always be a, a compromise in terms of um, the historical legacies around um, certain museums um, um, that we have in this country, and how you know how the how the nation, or how the national or the nation, or have kind of thought about the way in which it wants to collect and display um, and how that's been done historically. And and there's no doubt there's there's ties between that and colonialism because of the way in which the relationship between state and money and stuff like that, which those ties are still there today in terms of the British state and, and the funding bodies. You still have those ties and those relationships. So there would always be that compromise in relation to that. However, having said that, um, what's been interested particularly in the latter half of the 20th century and the beginning of this century as there been a there been a rise of um of new spaces um uh particularly i mean spaces in 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 britain uh, um and and how and how people have kind of readdressed that and also um how people have readdressed that abroad so i'm um, very quickly i just want to take two very very quick examples um um, House de Comte in, in, in Berlin, which basically had huge ties with, uh, with Nazism, um, was very much, I would say, turned around by the implementation of the curatorship of, of Okri and Weiser, who died, um, who died last year. So, um, so, that, so there were strategies and ways one could do that. And, and in some way, we're trying to do that now. However, I think the problem we have with that is how do we address physical institutions that have a legacy along with its kind of participants who don't seem to reflect a kind of more diverse um, representational community um, of ideas as well as um, other interests. And that's the compromise which I feel that needs to happen. Mm, thank you for that. Can I, we, we, have, we have a few minutes to close and I, I was going to, to close by asking you about the role of art schools, but perhaps I can inflate it with a question from Nick in the chat box, which I think is a really astute question. What would you say is, the dis, what, what would you say is distinctive about the current conjuncture, to use Stuart Hall's famous term, in terms of how younger activists, artists and cultural practitioners are bringing about change? So perhaps this connects to the question about art schools but what are what is it about the current moment that younger act, activists artists and cultural practitioners are bringing about change grace do you want to have a go at that and then i'll try and draw in hugh and david to close well i guess it's the relentlessness of what they're not giving up you know what i mean they're willing to take bigger risks they're willing to lose jobs or you know they're willing to really risk their necks and i think that that's that's going to make the difference 
And what I'm really interested in is when these, let's say people who are 20 now are 40, okay, and they enter the workforce and they're put in positions of where they have to either negotiate with the old establishment, you know, so take dirty money and put it in the museum, or if we've managed to do enough work now, collectively, so that at that point when they're 40, they won't have to deal with those issues, you know. And I do think it's a matter of being, yeah, like I say, being relentless and keeping the momentum. So when all these people are in different positions of power, which they will be, that they'll be able to withstand, you know, um, the pressure. Because the pressure, you know, whether you're white or black, it's the same pressure, you know, that people... Um, come up with, you know, uh, if you're fundraising or you're, you know, dealing with pe other people in power. So, yeah, I think that's what it is. It's going to take some really hardcore um, work. But I feel like young people are quite hardcore, which yeah. is good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Hugh, are you there? Could you, could you have a go at that question, Hugh, if you're there? I live in hope that Hugh might hear us. <laughs> I think he can, but it's so frustrating he can't respond. Um, but David, perhaps I can turn to you and, and, and we'll see if we can get you back. Sure. There was a suggestion in one of the questions that if it was possible, if you if you can hear us, if we can write down a few notes that we could read out. That was one of the sorry, oh, yeah. questions that I was reading out. So at least because um, we're all interested in now what he has to yeah. say about some of these things. That, that's a great idea. So um, and that was a question by somebody who, who raised that as one of the questions. Um, I just wanted to say very quickly that um, in terms of our generation, my generation, one of the things that brought us together was the art schools um, and also um, some of us who didn't go to art school and co went to colleges and stuff like that. So for instance, the Black Art Group, which was formed at Wolverhampton, was very much about forming an alliance in relationship in a kind of art school environment to kind of contest that. And what I felt, feel quite interesting now, and this conversation I always have with somebody like Isaac Julian is that I always say to Isaac, like, we are now in the position that we were kind of refuting um, over 30 or 40 years ago. So like myself, Keith Piper, Eddie Chambers, Lebena Himid, my partner Sonia, Boy, we are all now in art schools. You know, mm -hmm. did you see what I mean? We all now teach in art schools, we all now take, participate in art schools at that level so it's a question about you know how does one bring that disparate history together but also raising the point that grace has made in terms of bringing with us um collectively with this younger generation who i agree grace who are relentless in relationship to wanting to see change um with a previous generation who kind of in some ways enforced an element of change and it's about bringing those different generations together um, collectively, which I feel is the, the thing that needs to happen now yeah. to make that happen. That's such a challenge, but also a real call to arms. Um, what a fantastic conversation. I know it's been frustrating to have these technical issues, but it's also frustrating because we have so much more to say and impossible to contain it in an event like this. But this is the beginning, I hope, of a longer conversation. My thanks to Grace Derutu, Hugh Locke, and David A. Bailey, and to our organizers, especially Sophie Gargraves. And thank you, too, for your questions. There were so many brilliant ones. But the work goes on, but th this discussion, which I think has been really powerful and pressing reminds us how important it is to to reiterate our, our commitment to it a, a reminder that the UAL graduate showcase um, event program runs until Friday do um, drop into other events if you can and the showcase website is available now if you're at home do join me in socially isolating in, an, in a clap in a, a collective applaud for our, <laughs> our brilliant guests um, and uh, I hope that we'll carry on this conversation in other fora going forward. Thank you again. Goodbye.